Hi class, this is Mrs. Lyons. This is your first podcast, Chapter 1, Section 1. We're talking about matter and change. A lot of this information should be a review from your middle school science. When we talk about matter, we're going to talk about the properties of matter. But before we get into that, let's define matter. Matter is anything that has mass and takes up space. In other words, matter is anything that has mass and volume. Mass is defined as the measure of the amount of matter. Volume is how much space that matter takes up. Okay, so just some pictures here. Large boulder, we know that this, if we were to take the mass of this, it definitely has mass. And it's taking up space, okay? Water has mass, we could weigh it, we could ma take the mass of it, we could measure it, and it takes up space. Some One type of matter that people often um, have a misconception about is, is a gas. And inside of this balloon are many particles that are separated by a lot of empty space. However, if you take the mass of that empty balloon and then blow it up, fill it up with air, the mass increases. Okay, so this balloon has mass. It definitely takes up space. So the air in that balloon is also matter. So what, what is matter made up of? The smallest unit of any element is the atom. Okay, and we're going to talk a lot about a, a bunch of different elements and different types of atoms. Okay, an atom is the smallest piece of an element that has the properties of that element. An element is um, a couple of things we need to define as an element. An element is a pure substance. An element is also made up of only one type of atom. Okay, so there's only one type of atom found in an element. Some examples of elements, um, things that we're probably familiar with, iron, if we abbreviate iron, and we'll talk about these abbreviations, Iron is Fe, if we want to write it in chemistry shorthand. Um, oxygen, the essential element in the air we breathe. We abbreviate it just O. Um, lots and lots of elements, okay? Hydrogen is another example of an element. Notice these things all only have one name, okay? If we look at the periodic table, something you're going to become very familiar with by the end of this class, the periodic table lists, and if we look here at this example, there are 118 spaces on the periodic table. And some of these last elements here, some of them have been discovered, some of them have not actually been documented as existing, but many of the up most of the other upper elements have been isolated, identified, the properties of identified. So if you look, there are a lot of elements. Zn is zinc, okay? Nitrogen is N. All of these are elements. They're a single type of atom that makes up that particular element. Another type of matter is a compound. A compound differs from an element in that a compound is made up of two or more elements. I should also add that a compound is a pure substance. Okay, and we're going to talk about pure substances and mixtures later on, but Keep in mind that a compound is a pure substance. The thing about these compounds, we said they're made up of two or more elements. These elements are bonded together chemically. Okay, 
so that they form one, one entity, one thing, one compound. Some examples, things that we're very familiar with. Water is a compound. The formula for water, we should all know this, is H2O. What this tells us is water is made up of two hydrogen, one oxygen. Okay, the subscripts, the little numbers here, tell us how many of the atom that come before it there are in the compound. If there's no subscript, we assume that there's one. Another example, when we exhale, we exhale carbon dioxide. Okay, carbon dioxide, the formula is CO2. So no subscript here, that tells us there's one carbon. The two here tells us there are two oxygen. Whoops. Oxygen. Okay. Um, we'll get into naming and formula writing as we go along. But the key thing here is that compounds contain more than one element. Okay, and these things are bonded together. Okay, they're held together as one unit. All right. Um, as we talk about properties of matter, we're going to want to talk about different things we can measure, different things we can observe. Extensive properties are properties of matter that depend on how much matter is present. Okay, some examples of extensive properties would be the mass the volume. These are all things that we can measure. They're quantities. Um, if we wanted, we could measure the length of something. Okay, so for instance, think about, think about this. If I have a penny, okay, and in one sample, and in another sample, I have five pennies. Okay, if I put this one penny on the balance and I measure the mass, I'm going to find that the mass is relatively small, maybe 1.5 grams. If I put this second sample on the balance and I take the mass of it, I'm going to find that the mass is something like 7.5 grams. So the mass changed with the amount of matter I have present. That makes mass an extensive property. On the other hand, we have intensive properties. These are properties that do not depend on the amount of matter present. All right, some examples you might be able to think of. These are things that no matter how much matter, no matter how much stuff we have, we can identify this property as the same. One thing is color, okay? The color doesn't change. Um, the density, it doesn't matter. And we'll talk about exactly what density is later in the unit. Density is a measure of mass per volume. And that's something that stays constant with a sample. Um, the boiling point, in other words, the temperature where the substance goes from a liquid to a gas. If we have a very small sample or a very large sample, the boiling point stays the same. Okay, so these are all examples of intensive properties. Next we're going to talk about physical properties. Physical properties are properties that can be observed or measured, so they can be intensive or extensive, without changing the identity of the substance. Okay, so some examples of physical properties are, again, all of those intensive and extensive properties we just talked about. Color, mass, density, boiling point. All of these can be measured without changing the substance. Okay, we can observe them without turning the substance into something new. Okay, so for example, I have, 
I have a sample here. This is sulfur. Okay, if we were to observe this sample, we would say, first of all, it's a solid. Okay, that's its state. It's a solid at room temperature. We could observe that it's yellow in color. Um, we could, we could break it into smaller pieces, and if we tried to break it, we would find out that it's brittle, meaning it breaks into pieces. It, it doesn't, you can't smooth it into longer, bigger, uh, thinner pieces. Um, we could measure the boiling point. We could heat this up and get it to go from solid to liquid and measure the point where it, where it boiled. We could weigh it and measure the mass. So we can observe all of those properties of this sulfur. Here's another example. Um, this is copper. And again, we can make some observations about that copper. We can look at, it's kind of shiny. That's a property. It's, it's copper colored or orange or reddish orange. Um, it's kind of bumpy, not very smooth. If we tried to break this, we would find that this doesn't break into pieces easily. It's, it's not brittle like sulfur. Um, we could measure the boiling point if we could get the temperature up high enough. We could take the mass. Okay, so those are physical properties. Keeping on this, the track of physical things, things that don't change the identity, we have physical changes. Physical changes are changes in the substance that doesn't involve a change of the identity. Okay, so physical changes, essentially another way of saying physical changes is saying a change of state. And by state, we're talking about the three states of matter, solid, liquid, and gas. Okay, so Let's, let's look specifically at those three states of matter, and then we'll talk about the physical changes. There I have a, a, a physical change of melting, okay? Um, physical changes, changes of state, change of one substance from one state to another. Okay, so let's look at these states of matter. Solids. Solids, this should all be review, have a definite shape. They have a definite volume. The particles in a solid are packed close together. Okay, so up here in this picture, we have each of these balls is a particle, is an element or a compound. And when we have a solid, these particles, notice they're packed, they're packed tight together. There's no empty space between them. Okay, as a result, there are some strong attractive forces because they're touching each other, they feel each other. If one particle moves, the next particle feels it. In a solid, there's very little movement. There's um, vibration. The particles kind of are so close together, that they kind of move, but they don't really... They don't really move a lot, as we see in other states of matter. All right? The second state of matter is liquid. Liquids have a definite volume, but an indefinite shape. If we pour a liquid from one container to another, it takes on the shape of that other container. Um, a picture of a, a liquid. Notice the difference here. The particles are closer together, but there is some empty space in between these particles. Okay, This is a characteristic of liquids. There's still very strong attractive forces because the particles are still close together. They're bumping into each other, okay? But they're not as strong as in solids. This is liquid mercury, another example of a liquid. Liquid water is the, the, the most common liquid that we're used to. The last state of matter that we want to be familiar with is the gas state. Gases have no definite shape, no definite volume. If we look at a, at a picture, a particle diagram of the ga a gas, the particles are spread far apart. There's a lot of empty space. This is all just empty space in here. And these particles are in constant random motion. The arrows are showing that these particles are moving constantly. They're far apart. They're moving. 
because they're so far apart, there's very low attractive forces between them. An example um, of a gas, when we blow up a balloon, we contain that, the air in the balloon. That's a gas. So changes of state, back to this, changes of state are when we, is a physical change. Okay, we're not changing the substance from one thing to another. It's staying the same. So in this example, we have an ice cube, and it's melting. When this ice cube is in the solid state, it's H2O, it's water. When it's in the liquid state, it's H2O, it's water. Okay, so we haven't changed the identity of the matter. We've just changed the state. So we know that when we go from solid to liquid, we call that melting. The opposite, when we go from liquid to solid, we call that freezing. Let's change this. This should be liquid to solid. Vaporization is when we go from a liquid, so like the, the lake down here, it, and then we've got the steam coming off of the lake. Liquid to gas is called vaporization. Condensation, we see this on the shower. When we take a shower, we get that, that layer of water on our shower wall. What is that? That's condensation when a substance is going from a gas to a liquid. And then two that we're not as familiar with, I think, sublimation is carbon, example, carbon dioxide. You see it in, in dry ice when it, you form that eerie kind of steam. You use it Halloween and, and it, it's cool to, uh, to look. Sublimation is when a substance goes directly from the solid state to a gaseous state. And then the opposite of that is deposition, which I don't have a picture of. But deposition is what happens when um, snowflakes form in the clouds. It goes directly from a gas to a solid. Okay, so those are the changes of state that you need to be familiar with and, and recognize that terminology. Okay, that is your first podcast. You should now go take the online quiz. Just It's a practice, not really a quiz. It goes in as homework grade to check to make sure you've got the concepts that we went over, and I will see you in class.